unless they are really trained in dog who understand English words and all that. They should that the dog understands English word, but probably the dog doesn't understand English word. It can only understand the international sound. Like a cat. Cat also can understand an international sound. Uh, and then a child, a child in the cradle, who, uh, whose mind is not yet uh, formed, so who, whose thought structure has not yet formed, means the child doesn't have the language structure in its mind yet. So such a child can happily understand the international sounds. For example, uh, if you say to me, if you smile, the child smiles back. And if you say, la la la, something like that, the child understands. And if you show anger, and uh, make an international sound, uh, like, oh, like that if you say, the child is afraid. And if you make an international sound of love, uh, the child will be able to appreciate it. So, the animals, the children who do not have language in them yet, they all can understand the international sound. And, uh, um, and uh, I am studying to give an example of the international sound, like you say to the dog, chup, 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 like that you say to the dog, that is an international sound. This international sound is, uh, is used quite often by humans to convey the, the emotions like love, etc. And they are easily understood even by animals and uh, children who do not have language in them. And the OM, now this is OM, where does it fit? Is it an alphabetical sound or is it an international sound? That is a, a what we have to understand. These colors of Sanskrit, the, the Vyakarana people, the grammarians, they try to present it as an alphabetical sound. So they give us an elaborate grammatical derivation and all that. For example, they say, Ava. Ava is a verbal root, you find it in Sanskrit, which means to protect. Ava Rakshane. And also to this verbal root, you add a, a suffix, what they call Pratyaya. It is called Manin. Manin is the Pratyaya. So Ava plus Manin. And so this Va, it is a, a half vowel, and half consonant, half vowel. It falls back to the vowel, what we call samprasaranam, a phylological process, and then it becomes u. Va falls back as the full vowel becomes u. A plus u becomes o. And the suffix of manin, it provides the makara, that anin etc. will disappear, so you will arrive at o. The meaning of the word is a word now, uh, grammatically derived from a verb plus a suffix. And now its meaning is that which protects. So, avati, rakshati, iti, like that they derive. In deriving that, the grammarians have shown their scholarship and uh, they may be congratulating themselves that we have done a great job in uh, deriving the meaning of the home. But in doing so, they have done a service also. They have converted the home into an alphabetical sound. Thereby, it becomes the word of the Sanskrit language. And in becoming so, it has lost its universality in the process. So, in spite of such an effort on the part of the Canadians to present the home as an alphabetical sound of the Sanskrit language, so, but the fact remains that home is not an alphabetical sound. It is an international sound. By saying so, why should I insist so? Because Om is a universal sound. If you make it, all glory to Sanskrit language and literature, but if you make it an alphabetical sound of Sanskrit language, then it has already lost its universality. It becomes restricted to one language. But on the other hand, it is a, a cosmic sound. <coughs> that, that part I will come. It is a universal sound, and therefore, it is not alphabetical, it is international. And uh, thereby, it can be part of every language, every culture, every religion, every geographical regional region, people belong to every geographical region, 
and also it can be a song that common to all periods of human history. It was there uh, uh, thousands of years back in the holy past, and that even today the song rules the hearts of people all over the world. It is a truly universal, international sound. Oh. So, and, uh, uh, so, what is its significance as an international sound? I will come to it. Then, uh, Om is not only a uh, universal sound, it is a cosmic sound. Universal means uh, covering the entire uh, human, human, so humanity on the globe. But then uh, it is not just a uh, universal alone, it is the cosmic sound. Because uh, it is the nature's sound. If you learn to observe the nature, I say so because uh, people have, uh, we, we the people, we are the people, we the people, we have lost some of our uh, uh, connectedness with the nature. So we, uh, in our, uh, uh, in, 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 in so far we talk of progress, in our uh, uh, pursuit of progress, modernity, uh, so we get isolated from the nature. Uh, in fact, we, we do that. We, we are no more uh, terrestrial in a way. We have made ourselves uh, uh, celestial in the sense that uh, we do not walk barefoot on the ground anymore. And uh, our, even our souls do not come into contact with the uh, naked earth, the, the mud, etc., mud, the dust, etc. Uh, we, we do not uh, touch all that with our uh, uh, naked souls. Uh, and uh, souls means what I mean, the feet and the under the feet. And also many people, even within the home, they wear chapels and they walk uh, uh, inside the home with chapels. Therefore, uh, they, they don't touch the earth with their physical body anymore. And uh, even while getting down from the bed, they put their, their, their the feet into the soul, to the chapels and walk around. And therefore, and, uh, then uh, they leave the chapels on the ground and they lift the feet onto the bed. And so they never come into contact with the, with the earth. So we are no more terrestrial, that is how we made ourselves. And then we go for the acupuncture, not acupuncture, acupressure. So there are doctors who practice acupressure and people uh, line up in queue to get the acupressure treatment. You don't need any acupressure treatment if only you leave the chapels aside and walk barefoot uh, uh, on the ground. And then, uh, so this is how, uh, uh, I don't want to digress into the topic. So we have uh, isolated uh, ourselves uh, from the nature physically and also emotionally because uh, uh, all our parts are converted into uh, apartment complexes. If any water bodies like tanks, uh, uh, etc., they are all gone. They are all filled up and apartment complexes were put. Water bodies have disappeared from the society. We don't have any water bodies left. So for example, if there is a water body like a tank, it has no value. But if you fill it up as land, it has value. So for us, land is more valuable than water. So if they become then water is more valuable than water. Land gets just wealth. That is, water doesn't get any money. But a day will come. The whole situation will be reversed. Anyway, so what I am trying to say, in our mad pursuit of modernity and uh, progress, Though I do not want to sound uh, hostile towards progress and modernity, probably we need it. Whether we need it or not, the flow of society will not be able to stop it because change is the law of nature. And so nobody can stop the change. Change happens. The society and the, the humanity, the nature, follows its own dynamics. And so we can only be a witness to the changes that happen. Anyway, having acknowledged all that, so we have lost some of our, uh, some of our uh, ability uh, to commune with nature. If you still retain uh, that ability to commune with the nature, that means what you walk in a park alone, you stop talking with others, you 
do not have a cell phone to disturb you in your pocket ringing. You are left to remove your remote now. You are remote. I are totally separated from all these trappings around you. You will not look in your life saying. Then uh, you are keenly observing. Suppose while walking alone, I am lost in my thoughts. Then uh, I, I lost the touch with the nature. Mm -hmm. I may be in the park. I may be walking here in a beautiful forest. But if I am lost in my thoughts, uh, uh, which are the worldly thoughts, uh, so I am not in communion with the nature. That is not there at all. But if I remain silent, not only outwardly, but also inwardly I remain silent. So there is a lack of remaining silent within. And at that time, your awareness will be at its peak. You will be keenly aware of the nature around you. And of the movements of the nature. And if any if a, if a bird is on flight, you can hear the, that sound made by its wings. And then, uh, if there is a breeze, you can hear the, the sound made by the branches of the trees uh, moving with their heads in that breeze. And if there is a brook uh, flowing, uh, water flowing, you can, if you are keenly aware, you can be, if you are keenly aware, then you can hear uh, the beautiful uh, sound made by the cascading water. And uh, so, then there is a bird, a chirping bird. It, uh, it makes a, a chirping noise, a sound, and then you can be very uh, keenly aware of the noise. And then uh, uh, suddenly a leaf, it, uh, it, uh, uh, it drops uh, from the tree, and uh, it slowly uh, falls. Uh, lazily it falls to the, uh, to the buoyancy of the air, uh, and finally, when it hits the ground, uh, it makes ever so sudden small sound. And if you are uh, keenly aware of all this nature's sound, you have to make a practice of all that. Because we have lost that keenness that a human uh, to be aware of the nature's sound. So we lost it. We have destroyed all the nature around us. And uh, so, uh, if you can find yourself, put yourself in the the embrace of the pure nature, and then uh, remove all the worldly flow of thoughts from your mind and become silent of worldly and worldly. And then you are fully aware of the nature's sounds. <laughs> I made a big uh, a description uh, to create that ambiance, at least psychologically. And so when you hear the nature's sounds, you will hear an own. That is what I was trying to say. The sound ohm is, uh, is reverberating all over the nature. It is there in a uh, lazily flowing uh, river. You can hear the Omkara. In the chipping uh, uh, sound of a bird, you can hear Omkara. For example, now a Vasanta Masa is coming. And in the Vasanta Ru, the Chaitra Masa, uh, sometime between March 15th to April uh, and then. Uh, if there are a few woods around you, if there are any woods around you, if there are any woods left in this city, then uh, it is possible that a cuckoo, a cuckoo will come from somewhere. And uh, it will start its uh, beautiful, uh, sonorous uh, sound. Cuckoo, mm -hmm. like right that, it will be singing. And uh, if you carefully listen, you should be happy, you should have uh, that will not be uh, uh, visual. Suppose you are busy with the TV or with something else, etc., you will miss all that. But if you carefully listen to the uh, sound made by the cuckoo, uh, which I do quite often, every year I do that, uh, I do it as a meditation for myself. And so now the cuckoo started its, uh, its uh, uh, music concert, and so I drop everything and uh, I go into meditation. That is a meditation for me. Just listening to the cuckoo's sound, cuckoo, cuckoo. It makes a sound five, six times, and then as though it is annoyed, it stops and then restarts again after a small gap. In that uh, sound of the cuckoo, you have omkara. So, in the barking of a dog, there is omkara. In fact, uh, is a Sama. Sama is the name for song. And in uh, Chandogya Upanishad, you have uh, 
Shunaka Sama, the, the sacred sound uh, that resembles the howling of a dog uh, in the night, sometime in the night. Like this, the Omkara is the nature's sound. And that it is, uh, in that sense, it is the cosmic sound. I made it, uh, first I made it universal sound, and then I have taken it to the nature's sound. Now I will put it uh, on the pedestal of cosmic sound. You see, in Chandogya Nishat, in the very beginning, there is one uh, section which we call the Gita Vidya. In Chandogya Nishat, every section is uh, named as Vidya. Vidya is uh, a particular contemplation, that is what Vidya means, contemplation. To Gita Vidya, that is how the operation begins. There uh, it says the, the rising sun is called Ravi. Ravi is a very well known name of the sun. Why the sun is called Ravi? Because uh, the sun rises with a sound, Rava. And God will not hear that sound. If we hear the sound of uh, the sun, our ear uh, drums will break apart. We will not be able to stand that sound. Such a uh, ferocious sound it must be. Fortunately, we don't hear it. It is far away from us. And uh, that sound that the sun makes as he rises in the eastern horizon, that sound is oh, That is how Chandra presents. And so, that's why Rava is the sound. The one who has this Rava, the sound that resembles the Om, that sound the sun has. Hence, the name of the sun, Ravi, the one who makes the sound Om. So this is how Omkara is a cosmic sound. So this is how I, I progress from the alphabetical sound to international sound, which is a universal sound, and which is the sound of the nature, and then it is the cosmic sound. Um, you see, they describe, just to conclude the cosmic sound aspect, they say the universe is born out of sound. That is called the Shabda Srishti Vada, the thesis in which the, the origin of the creation is presented as a sound. This vada, for example, you have paramanu vada, the origin of the creation is uh, the paramanus. This is the vada, this is the thesis uh, uh, presented by Kanada, the sage Kanada. And then we have uh, pradhana vada, this is by Sankhyas. So the universe has its origin in the uh, that primordial uh, stuff uh, called Pradhana, which is constituted by the three Munas of Pradhana's Tamas. So that is another Vada. Like that, there are many Vadas uh, about this uh, creation. So, what they call cosmogony. And uh, there is one Vada, very unique Vada, which you find in Brahma Sutras, described by Shankara in his Bhashya, uh, especially in uh, a section called Devata Adhikaranam. So there, Shankara presents this uh, thesis called Shabda Srishti. All creation originates from sound. The example given is, uh, I, I hope you appreciate the example. It could be a little difficult. The example is like this. There is a pot. The pot is created uh, from sound. How the pot is created from sound? You see, the pot maker, he takes the clay and molds it into a, a pot. That is how pot is created. But then uh, the pot is molded by the, by the pot maker in a particular way. Then only pot will be created. So what is it that helps the pot maker to mold the clay? What is it? The clay doesn't mold itself into the pot. The clay doesn't transform itself into the pot. Even after the transformation, the pot continues to be the clay only. So clay remains a clay. Then what is the pot? It's a shape. Pot is nothing more than a shape. As a substance, it is clay only. Then the substance is clay. 
in substance is there, then what is part? Part is a shape. Now this is shape, what is the origin of this shape? It did not come from the clay. Clay doesn't have clay is an essential thing. It doesn't have uh, the, the psychology of a shape uh, in it. And so the shape, it has originated from the mind of the pot matter. And so that shape, and that shape, uh, where from did it come into the mind of the pot matter? It came into this mind uh, from a sound. What is the sound? Par. Par is the sound. So first, he contemplates the sound, par. The moment uh, the word, par, the shabda, par, it, uh, uh, it springs up in his mind. Immediately, that shabda, it gives rise to an idea of a shape called par. And the idea of the shape is uh, translated into the clay which takes the form of the path. So this is how the path has come from the sound path. In Sanskrit we say ghata, the path is created from the word ghata. This idea that all creation came from the sound is very much uh, present in the one version of Bible also. Bible has three, four versions like Matthew, 